Emily, thanks for joining us on the Pair Program. Uh, this is a, a another bonus episode of a mini series that we call "How We Hatched," uh, and so today we've got Emily Shario. Uh, she's spending time with us. Emily's the founder and visionary behind Turbine, um, a startup that's bridging the gap in supply chain visibility for consumer brands. She's also a military spouse uh, and a parent of two toddlers and a dog. Um, all while juggling this task of building an early stage startup, which I just can't wait to to dig into on how you find balance in your life. Uh, but uh, Emily, I'm excited to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Cool, cool. All right, let's jump in. Um, you know, I always like to start every one of these episodes with like a real thought provoking question. So, what did Emily Shario have for breakfast this morning? So I start every day with two cups of coffee. Uh, I usually nice. have two cups of coffee um, before 7 a.m. and then no more coffee for the rest of the day. Wow. Cream and sugar? Yeah. What, are, what Oat uh, milk? What are you? No sugar. Um, usually black. Okay. Sometimes special treat of condensed milk, but only if I'm at home. If, I if I go out and I'm having a cup of coffee, it's black, like my nice. soul. <laughs> I was going to say, you really learn a lot about somebody's coffee order. It's like, oh, nice. A lot of people out there drink creamer with a splash of coffee. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is my judgmental take on, on morning coffee. Yeah. I've always had, um, this will be really embarrassing uh, for everybody that's listening, but I've always had like some, you know, some issues with dairy and um, mm -hmm. it doesn't do the best with my stomach. And so I felt like it was my wife's like a dietitian and she's like, why don't you just try like oat milk for just once? And I was like, yeah, that sounds like it's going to be terrible. And I love it. I think it actually adds a pretty interesting <laughs> flavor to it. Um, so I did not drink coffee at all until after I had my first kid. Oh, interesting. I, yeah. I, I like to say I grew up inside of a Dunkin' Donuts. My mom started working at Dunkin' Donuts in 1999 and still works at Dunkin' Donuts till this day. Wow. And so growing up, I, I learned everything inside of a Dunkin' Donuts, how to do, how to make change. I learned from working the cash registers uh -huh. with my mom, um, how to show up to work on time. I learned as a 14 year old, uh, when I was working my, um, weekly shifts, you know, I really learned a lot inside that Dunkin' Donuts. And one thing that I would see is you'd have these regular people who came every day, two or three times a day spending $20, $30 on coffee every day. Oh, and that puts such a sour taste in my mouth of like, wow, this is a real drug that people need. Yeah. Um, you know, you'd see people, people love to joke, like, don't talk to me before my morning cup of coffee. But I have seen what people are like before their morning cup of coffee. Uh, and so I took that experience to really be adamant. I wasn't going to do coffee. I wasn't going to do caffeine. I don't drink soda. Did the whole college experience with like maybe the occasional Red Bull, but not really. Uh -huh. um, and it wasn't until I had my first kid where I was like, I just am not making it anymore. <laughs> and so started drinking. Uh, my husband is an avid coffee drinker, enjoys it, loves it probably his blood is half coffee. And uh, I did not start drinking coffee until after I had my first kid. And now I find joy in the ritual of just starting my day with two cups of coffee before mm -hmm. my kids are awake, before anyone needs anything from me. It's like my chance to take a couple moments to start the day right. Yeah. I've got so many questions right now. Like, Tor the torture of growing up in a Dunkin' Donuts and never drinking coffee. Um, Is your it mom, torture though? I mean, it's just constantly surrounded by it. it just seems like now knowing how much you like love yeah. coffee. But I guess it, you're right. It's kind of like the routine of it. But I'd love to have your mom on this podcast and just kind of <laughs> hear the the Dunkin' Donuts story as well. That's we can make impressive. That happen. Yeah, seriously. And don't get me wrong. Like I had Dunkin' Donuts flagged in my notes. I saw, I appreciate that it's still on your LinkedIn profile. And I was like, I'm totally going to bring up Dunkin' Donuts and see how that experience was. So thank you for checking that box off of my, my notes here. Um, cool. Well, let's, um, let's get into the thick of it, right? Um, I always like to 
roll back the clock a little bit and uh, hear a little bit more about you and, and, and your journey and where you, where you grew up and what kind of led you down this path into tech. We'll, we'll obviously get into turbine and the problems that you're solving, but uh, let's start from the roots. What, you know, where, where'd you grow up and, and uh, tell us a little bit about that story. So I am originally from New Jersey and we were talking about this earlier, have slowly migrated further south. So currently live in Columbus, Georgia. Uh, I've been running away from the snow for the past 25 years. Um, Originally from New Jersey, uh, grew up in Newark, went to high school in Elizabeth for folks who are familiar, and took what I would call a very conventional or safe path. I saw myself, and still in a lot of ways do, as pretty risk averse, pretty uh, high achieving, um, ambitious person. Um, And so very focused on school, very focused on sports. was, you know, that three sport varsity athlete who did all the AP classes in high school, uh, was lucky enough to go to college for basically free and went to Princeton. That really opened a lot of doors for me. Um, I was the first person in my family to go and graduate from college. And, um, really that transformed a lot of opportunities, went on to take a post-grad fellowship called Venture for America. Venture for America takes recent college grads and puts them in startups. So I moved to Baltimore where I worked for an amazing company called Alleview for a, a, an incredible founder by the name of Jess Gartner and um, the chief product officer, Jason Becker. And it was such an incredible learning experience, really fell in love with startups, really learned to code and become more technical in that role, um, and then have taken on a couple of other roles since moving across verticals, but primarily thinking about how companies use data. So it was the first data hire at Smile Direct Club, the straight teeth company. I was the first data analyst at GitLab, had a bunch of roles there in the time I was there, and then um, went on to be director of data at Netlify before eventually taking the path that led me to Turbine. So um, it's interesting because if you had asked me at any point in the previous 20 years, like, do you see yourself starting a company? I wouldn't have said yes. I think like when you grow up uh, in the environment I was in, so financial precarity and children of immigrants, you're looking for the m- safest route all the time, right? Like what, what is the most secure bet here? Stable, the- right? What's st- stability? Exactly. And um, entrepreneurship doesn't fit that criteria. <laughs> yeah. And so um, with, I, I've always been focused first and foremost on like driving business impact and doing the thing that needs to be done. Um, and so it's, it's interesting how that, despite my background and, and being a little bit more risk averse, how I still ended up in this kind of entrepreneurial place. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, journey. And I always, you know, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and you, you, one of the questions I usually will, will open with or, 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 you know, pry into is, you know, were your parents entrepreneurs? You know, is that something that's just kind of deep rooted in the DNA, which is oftentimes a journey. But I think for you, you know, it's, you're, you're kind of a product of your experiences. And I, and I, I, I was when I was studying your background, you know, it, you're, straight out the off the break that venture for america i think is what an awesome experience right because it kind of immediately kind of gave you some exposure into the startup ecosystem which most folks you know they are either they either stumble into it or you know they i don't know if it's always just like i'm going to join a startup like that's my thing i think you just everybody's got a different unique pathway into how they get fall into the startup world um, so Venture for America, I thought was like, you know, highlighted with, you know, a big, a big yellow pin here of like, okay, this, this is starting to add up paired with, you know, your experience in smaller companies, seeing them kind of grow that, that excitement. And then um, Amplify Partners, which we'll talk about as well, um, you know, leading you to, you know, your, your own uh, uh, business. But I do have a quick question. So what did you study um, at Princeton? American politics, 
which is wow. totally unrelated to everything. <laughs> uh, so my I I graduated college for those who aren't looking up. I graduated college in 2015. And as an American politics major, my like sketched out plan was that I was going to pick the right presidential campaign, ride that to the White House hmm. and work in the White House for eight years, then go do whatever DC people do. <laughs> that was like the the tentative plan. Um, but, you know, the, the thing about work and professional ambitions is that um, they can't exist in a vacuum from our personal lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was lucky enough to meet my now husband back in college. So we started dating seriously um, junior year of college. And I wanted to figure out how to make my professional ambitions happen while also having um, this relationship that I really valued and saw a future with, but didn't know what that would look like and wasn't willing to give up my professional ambitions to make that happen. And so mm -hmm. part of the reroute into Venture for America was that um, I didn't want to go be a cog in someone's big machine. Um, so I didn't want to go work for a big company. I wanted a job that was going to give me remote flexibility or like a, a path to that in the future. This is 2015 where nobody hires recent college grads to work remotely. This no. isn't, you know, post COVID totally different world. Um, and so venture for America gave me the opportunity to both be impactful and have a path to, um, flexible remote future. Mm -hmm. Um, in all of you. And so <laughs> the way to connect the dots between what I studied in school and my professional career is that um, within that politics major, I was very focused on quantitative analysis. So I focused on um, political methodologies, which some other schools would call political science. So thinking of it as a true social science, how do you run experiments? How do you change behaviors? How do you quantify impact? Um, and so learned how to build some statistical forecasting and analysis in undergrad that I then went on to use in my professional work. Um, so the skills are there. It's just instead of applying it to political domains, yeah. I'm applying it to conversion rates and um, the, other <laughs> the other domains that I interact with on a regular basis. Yeah, which I think is, uh, you know, becoming more and more common. Um, you know, folks don't just, you know, it's not just computer science or math. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, it's especially with AI, right? Like you're seeing um, how AI is impacting in so many different verticals. And so, you know, this is actually a, an episode we, we, we ran not too long ago, which is, you know, going uh, depth or breadth, right? Within, within, you know, the, your tech um, experience, especially for, you know, in, in school, like how much do you have to do you really be like the algorithmic, you know, guru versus, you know, having enough of a, a skill set if it's in healthcare, if it's in mm -hmm. politics, whatever it is. And then pairing that with data, uh, product, you know, uh, engineering. I think part of what we're seeing right now is this, um, society wide question around what is the role of college? What mm. is the role of higher education in general? Like, is college a different kind of technical training school where we're giving you these very specific hard skills around that are that you're going to use in your next job? Mm -hmm. Or is college some sort of different academic pursuit that you're going to spend time reading the great canon and classic literature. Mm -hmm. Like I had a mentor in college who, um, where I, I did my undergrad, you had a language requirement. I think you had to take like two years of language. And uh, he took that opportunity to take Greek and Latin. Hmm. I remember turning him like, Charlie, why? And he said to me, when else am I going to? Right. Like he looked at school as this academic pursuit opportunity. That's incredible. But that's really different from people who see it as like, this is the box that I need to check in order to get the job. Yeah. Yeah. I actually think we would probably be much better served as a society if we stopped thinking of um, 
college as a prerequisite to most jobs. Like Mm -hmm. some of the best engineers, data engineers, software engineers, data analysts that I've ever hired never went to school um, or never went to college. Right. Like, I don't, I don't know the right answer, but I think that's part of the open conversation right now is like, what is the role of college in preparing people for work? Or do we actually need something else? Is there a a boot camp or a technical training yeah. or something else that prepares those skills? I don't know, and I'm I'm no expert, but I think that's an open question that we're gonna see really change in the next decade. Yeah, and I you know, a couple of things on that note too is like one, I think boot camps are fantastic and I think they're becoming more and more um popular um, you know, for folks that just kind of went through school like most did and they're like, well shit, what am I doing in this? Yep. With this degree, I don't, you know, I, and getting into tech, right, and, and using a boot camp. But the other piece of that conversation is the ridiculousness that is student debt and the cost of education. Because oftentimes, too, what that does is put this burden and this anxiety on students that graduate and they say, well, I have to make X amount, right? So then they're pursuing something just for the money to pay off. Mm-hmm. You know, how am I going to pay off these student debts? I mean, med, medical school, too. I mean, that's ridiculous. Like, we, we obviously need more of that talent, yet it costs an arm and a leg to pursue that path. And so, you know, it's just a, <laughs> it's an interesting uh, area at large, but all, all in too, I would say that, you know, from a, a tech perspective, I do enjoy uh, seeing that it's no longer, it's just not like computer science is the way, mm-hmm. um, because that can be a deterrent and a lot of folks, you know, aren't going to get into tech if that's all there is. Um, we're seeing a, a much more diverse like pathway to get into technology. I think roles of like product management are are ones that are really opening up the the doors for folks as well. And data, right? Data being so yeah, every so everywhere right now. Um, you know, it can be applied in so many different ways. Um, which is a good Absolutely. segue for you too. So, you know, you you kind of gave a little bit of context into how you know your your political kind of poli sci um, uh, studies kind of led you down this path into data. So you you you, you jump into all of you, um, and then uh, through that, you made you know you made the connections with Venture for America. How did you find out about Venture for America? How did you, you know, who told you about them? Oh, you know what? I worked. I'm smiling because I haven't thought about this in a while and I should probably send her a note. But Emily Sang uh, is someone I worked with in the dining hall on campus. She was in the year above me and she did Venture for America. Oh, uh, cool. And she posted something about it on LinkedIn. And I actually think, yeah, she like posted applications are due tomorrow or something. And I was like, <laughs> well, I don't have a job. So this seems like a good thing to apply to. For sure. And so I applied, you know, mostly on a whim. And now I'm thinking about it. I should probably reach out to her and tell her how much that mattered. But yeah, Emily Sang posted about it on LinkedIn. And I knew her because I worked with her in the dining hall in college. Wow. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's funny how those little little Absolutely. decisions, those little paths can can create so so much uh, in your life. Um, yeah. So so that was a, a good experience. And then obviously you 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 begin getting some really, really interesting experience in the corporate space, working with some really heavy hitting, you know, names uh, within the world of tech. Um, talk to us a little bit about some of those, some of those uh, experiences and how they really kind of strengthened your exposure to the world of data and, and how it kind of groomed you into um, your, you know, your expertise at this point. Yeah. So one thing I really appreciated about my time at Alview um, was just how impactful I could be. You know, I didn't think this at the time, but now I can look back and see that I was a young, dumb 22 year old with no experience. Mm-hmm. I didn't know anything, but I still had a say. Like when I said things, people listened in part because I was employee number nine, right? Still, still a single digit person in this organization where it made such a huge difference. Every voice mattered um, until this day. Like I still consider the folks who hired me there people I send my regular turbine updates to because cool. I feel like they're part of my team. And 
I think what I've really come to appreciate as I like look back over the different roles I, that I've had is that I have always enjoyed being in places where I could feel like I was making a difference. And um, like I, I mentioned, I worked at GitLab. So I joined GitLab as employee number 282. At that point, it was the biggest organization where I had ever worked. Um, and I remember being worried like, oh, is 280 too big? Mm-hmm. Is this is this company a place that I'm going to thrive? Um, in the two and a half years that I was there, we grew all the way to over uh, 1,200 people. Um, GitLab was the largest all remote company in the world prior to the pandemic. <laughs> and so the GitLab that I joined and the GitLab that I left were completely different GitLabs. Like we added a thousand people in two and a half years. Wow. That is insane. But the moment that I was like, oh, okay, I, I think I'm ready to move on now was mm. um, I was working as interim chief of staff to the CEO working on a pricing project and, you know, related to some pricing changes we were exploring, we we're going to have to send an email out I'm sitting on this meeting. I'm laughing because it's sad to me, but I know that this is how companies operate. Um, I'm sitting on this meeting about sending this email. It's myself. It's um, someone who wrote the copy for the email. It's someone who's responsible to pull the list for the email. It's someone who's responsible for putting it into the system. It's someone who's responsible for signing off for it. There's like eight people in this meeting. It's a serious about email. sending one email. <laughs> and I remember getting off this meeting and just saying like, okay, I'm done here. Like, <laughs> this is the email, not email audit want. team. Yeah. And, you know, there are very large companies out there where people get to drive incredible impact and make a difference and wonderful technologies coming out of there. And, and there is a time and place. But I think one thing that I've really come to appreciate about myself is that I don't want to work in a place where the feedback loops are that long, sure. where, you know, you're making a plan that you're not going to see the results of for two or three years. Like I love when we get feedback from a customer in the morning and by the afternoon we have shipped a change to the app or, you know, something like that. Those are phenomenal experiences. And I don't think we, um, I don't think we get the opportunity to do that in a lot of things. So Mm -hmm. I think part of, for me, the appeal of startups has been this opportunity to really feel that I could drive change in the business in different roles and see the results of that change, not just in a theoretical on paper, here's how numbers should shift, but uh, an actual, here's what we did to the business. I mean, that's part of why I enjoy experimentation um, is that experimentation is we're going to make this change and let's see what happens over the next 60, 90, 180 days. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You wonder if that reaction would have been the same had you not had that exposure at all of you in those early days, right? Where it's like you you got to see what it was like firsthand and then it, to take that step in that other direction. Don't get me wrong, right? Because I did something similar uh, in my career where it's like, you know, went, went in a big, a big organization got pulled into a, a small organization, saw how quickly things were moving. It's almost like you can, you know, when you have firsthand interactions with mm-hmm. founders and the C, the C-suite, it's like this, this level of uh, power. It's like, wow, I can s- truly, truly see how this business is running and then go to start my own thing, fail in that, come back, work for a, a large organization. And I was just scratching at the walls to get out of there. It's like, I can't be in yeah. here. And it's yeah. like, if you don't get that experience or that, that visibility, you know, you never kind of know what it's like on the other side. And so some people yeah. just immediately go into the big corporate, you know, big, bigger companies and yes. there's nothing wrong with it. But I will say too, it's like, that was also a strategic play um, just because, you know, there is a level of like, Hey, like, you know, you're building your resume too. To have that on your your profile opens doors and gives you really like experience uh, that led you down to your next path, right? So it's like, yeah. Um, and 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 it sounds like this next role too was like this was like kind of more of like in a leadership role, like you were a director. Um, is it Netlify, right? So yes. 
What yeah. what was uh, what was your your your, your big kind of takeaways from that that experience? It's funny as you're talking because um, the thought that popped into my head was like some people their drug of choice is caffeine. Mine is driving business impact. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's a healthy drug though. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. So when I joined Netlify, I joined. Um, to lead the data organization. So the company had made a couple of decisions around how they wanted to invest in data, how data was actually going to feed into the product that we were selling to customers, not just like a true analytics purpose, but things like our billing process um, that we build customers on, our uh, analytics product, like how the data team was going to play very closely with all of that. Um, so it was a really compelling opportunity. I joined, um, got to, uh, the, com- the team had just done almost a completely, a complete turnover. So there was very little prior experience, came in with a relatively clean slate, hired a bunch of people and really, I think changed the way a lot of people in the company had used or interacted with data. It was a really incredible um, opportunity to change people's minds and drive impact. We brought in experimentation and a culture around that. Um, we brought, we added a company, added value to the company, not only in, you know, typical analytics, what are our revenues, what are the levers, but also just a better understanding of what are the parts of the business that can be adjusted to drive change. Like, I think. Um, something that Abhi Sav Asylum talks about a lot, that's one of my favorite frameworks around a business, is that like when it comes to a company, almost always the number one metric is revenue, right? There's or, or really profitability, especially in the current macro climate, right? Mm-hmm. For profitability, there's two levers you can pull. You can increase revenue, you can improve efficiency. And then if you keep thinking about it that way, you can decompose it for new rev or for increasing revenue you can bring on new revenue you could expand existing revenue and you can mm-hmm. continue to break it down and break it down and break it down and what that metric tree approach does is it helps you understand how an organization how a team in a company can drive an impact right so if the um, if you're rolling out an experiment around let's say conversion rates, or around product activation, um, you're basically trying to say, we think this experiment is going to drive this lever, which should hopefully add to that revenue number, right? But you can draw those dots. Mm-hmm. And um, too many people, I think, especially as orgs become bigger, if you're not intentional about it, people become so separated from the final goal. And I see it a lot, actually, um, in my work now is that I think a lot of people, whether or not they want to admit it, like kind of poo poo sales, right? People think like sales is slimy, it gets this like used car salesman reputation. But the thing about sales, if you're doing it correctly, it's all about like, how do I create as much value as possible yeah. for my customer? And there's a lot of ways you can do that, but just kind of being really clear on what you're trying to move, like mm-hmm. what does value mean for you or what you're trying to, how you're trying to drive business impact, whether that's through sales, whether that's through a new initiative, whether that's through an experiment completely depends on the context, but just like what is the problem we're trying to solve here? Being really clear on that unlocks a lot for you. Mm-hmm. And I think Netlify was the first time that I was in a leadership role where I didn't have, um, I was responsible for advocating that message. Yeah. There wasn't, I wasn't an executive to be clear. I, I reported into an executive, but I was in this leadership role where I had my department, I had my team, I had, you know, dozen, 8% of the company headcount reported into me and being able to say these these are the folks and here is how we make a difference to the company and being responsible for sharing that message um, really changed how I thought about communicating value in addition to just delivering value. Yeah. It's a really fascinating way of explaining it too. Cause it's like, 
you, it's almost like the light bulb goes off and it's like, oh my gosh, I, I see the value here. It's like, mm -hmm. now here, let me arm you sales team with how to go out and communicate this. And really, and exactly. that's the difference between a good salesperson and a bad salesperson is like the people that get it. And they're like, oh yeah, I see it. Like they, they can talk with passion and they can go on the front lines. That's why I think one of the most impactful roles are like sales engineers, or like solutions mm. architects, the folks that have the tech know how and can really talk to a, the pain points of a customer like yes. that is one of the most valuable skill sets and um because sometimes there is that loss that you, you you lose that in translation of the technical teams communicating with the sales teams and like you know making sure that they get it um but that's really interesting uh the way that you explain that and i just think that your mind is just like it's constantly it's like uh really fascinating what's going on in there I was even doing some digging on your, on 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 your uh, blogs and um, your swim class checklist, um, oh. and and just just the 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 fact of like you know yeah obviously it's like you know automation like how can I make this more efficient here? Um, these are obviously all like little cogs that build up you know how you're mm -hmm. becoming an entrepreneur and you wanting to build something that can help solve these problems. Um, but before we jump to turbine, uh, I I'm really, uh, really intrigued with the amplify partners experience because what you are doing at Netlify, um, you know, for your customers, it sounds to me like amplify is like, can you just do this for our portfolio too? you know, like really help our portfolio thrive as if each one of those were your customer. I just really think that that role and and um, expand on it for me, but was such a uh, a really interesting experience for you. What was it like for you? Yeah, I um, you nailed it. That is exactly what I did. Is the way to think about it. Um, it was we've got a bunch of companies that need this kind of expertise, but they don't need it full time. Mm -hmm. And does it make sense to bring this into the build team? Um, so you can work with multiple companies across the portfolio. I think you see this a lot in uh, go to market and recruiting. Like mm -hmm. oftentimes VC firms will have um, a go to market resource uh, that they can share across their portfolio, usually some sort of sales coaching or sales leaders who can be available. Um, or recruiting is another one where they'll have a, a team that supports that. Mm -hmm. I think I'm grateful to Amplify for running this experiment around data with me where um, I got to be that central resource for their portfolio. So um, I worked with companies across the portfolio on, you know, what is the right business metric? What are the right levers? What, you know, all these things that I did at Netlify, basically um, working with them to understand their businesses and where it made sense and where it didn't. I think. Um, one of the things that I saw working across m many companies in the portfolio was just how companies are more similar than they are different. Like there's mm -hmm. a reason we talk about B2B business models as separate from B2C business models. And that's because B2B business models relatively have a, a similar flow and the metrics you care about in those businesses are, are relatively the same, right? And there are these patterns in those businesses that we can lean into. Um, and so I worked and there's a couple of blog posts on the Amplify blog around this still. Um, that like, if you're a B2B SaaS company who is focused on this kind of go to market motion, like here are the metrics you need to report in your board meeting. Um, and thinking about like, you know, maybe every one of those does not apply to your specific business, but I hate staring at a blank screen. You know that experience of like, I need to put a presentation together or I need to write a blog post or whatever. And you're staring at this blank screen and you're like, uh, I don't know where to start, yeah. right? Like, my goal, I'm, I don't have all the answers. I'm not in your business every day in the way you are. You're the expert here. But my goal was to solve the blank screen problem and give you a starting place. Um, and I'm really glad I got to do that. And I really enjoyed the experience. And I learned a ton from the founders I worked with. Like it wasn't like I, mean, I these came are early, in. early stage startups, right? Just to paint the, the picture here. Like are these like um, C some. or what? 
Yeah. So many, I worked with founders that were in the seed stage. I worked at founders that were post B. So okay. kind of a, a wide gamut based on where the needs were in the company, in the por- across the portfolio at that point in time. And I want to say without like looking it up, I probably worked with 10 companies across their portfolio over the course of the year. So wow. really like the size of the engagement depended on what the business needed. Sometimes it was like, here's, let's hop on a call and just talk through this problem for an hour. And other times it was, um, you know, a a longer many months of let's work together. So it really depended on the business and where they needed, what problems they had, where, what internal structures they had already. I see. Yeah. um, Something that I thought was interesting just doing some research was that, you know, you're, you coming on kind of helped influence their investment hypothesis in a, in a way. Um, Because I don't, you know, I, I think it's, it's something that, you know, within venture, um, everybody's got a different hypothesis. And, um, you know, one of the things that we always kind of like come to market or, or, or come to try to be advocates for as a, as a recruiting slash kind of like community branding, marketing, you know, services firm, where we partner is like, you know, whatever we can do to add value beyond the check that's being presented, um, talent, right, obviously is a, is a huge one. But every, you know, one of the things that it sounds like they really saw value in with bringing you on is how to uh, more intentionally kind of study um, how startups within the portfolio use data to make like these strategic decisions, and and that's something that I haven't really seen a ton of, or I haven't seen like you know too many VCs kind of like vocalize like, hey, this is what what makes us unique, um, and so I do. Um, I do applaud uh, Amplify. I think that's a really strategic hire. Uh, and yeah, it sounds I, like a really cool exposure. I'll, I'll say one thing about the team there and Sarah in particular, uh, who's the GP, Sarah Cat and Sarah's the GP that I worked with the closest. One of the things about um, their current team is that a lot of them have worked before. Like when you look at VCs, a lot of times they'll be bankers who move into PE and then maybe into venture. Um, and I think one of the great things about that particular team is just the, the experience and how, um, how they all have all worked before. Sarah was director of data at Mattermark. She worked at Palantir. Like she had those really formative experiences in the data space and that I think she knew. And in fact, I still go to her like, hey, Sarah, like, how, how do how should I think about this problem? And she gets to pull on her, um, I don't know, decade of venture where she's been seeing across multiple companies and coach me um, through our our own struggles. So um, I think it's it's just a lot of stars aligned and their team is really incredible and phenomenal. And I'm glad to have them as our lead investor at Turbine. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, the like to to add to your point, I mean, there's just a level of credibility that comes with somebody who's sat in the seat of that skill set. Where I'm going to buy a lot more into your advice and 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 you know your your mentorship here versus you know you came from finance and that's what you do and that's yeah you know so it's a it's a really cool um, strategy. Um, sounds like a really interesting uh, experience for you. And and then so when when was it you know when when did the uh that itch kind of hit you and you're like you know what you know it's time to do my own thing um talk me through that process so in parallel to all the professional ongoings that we're talking about i also decided to go to grad school full time so um in 2020 the world is shutting down i find out i'm pregnant with my first kid And I looked at my schedule and I said, life is never going to be less hectic than it is right now. If I want to go to grad school, this is my chance. Uh, So applied to grad school, started in October, went to, uh, I was getting an MBA from UNC Chapel Hill, Keenan Flagler Business School. Great school. Um, And I did that full time while working full time. Wow. You psycho. <laughs> well, a, a little bit. Um, but 
you know, you alluded briefly to this blog post that's one of my most popular online called the Swim Class Checklist. And the general thesis of that blog post, um, for anyone who hasn't read it, is that like there are all these skills that we apply at work kind of unthinkingly building a checklist as you're running through a process so that someone else can do it more easily next time as a prime example. But we don't apply those same skills to our home life. Mm -hmm. So the example that I use in the blog post is uh, taking my kids to swim class. We do this special kind of swim called infant swim rescue. It's um, the way classes work. It's 10 minutes a day for five days a week for three to six weeks, depending on the cohort you're in. Um, And then it's not again for like three or four months. And so that means it's very intense and then none at all. And um, whether it's because you share that responsibility across multiple adults or if it's because you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel three months later when you're starting up the class again, my what I did for my family uh, was create that checklist and make it really easy the next time we go on. So I lean into a lot of these opportunities because I think that if we bring those same skills that we use to run an efficient workplace to the home, we can reduce the overall kind of emotional labor that takes that is required in operating a household, especially a household with two professionally driven adults who don't want to spend all their time on uh, coordinating doctors and dentists appointments or, sure. or figuring out what to pack for swim class. Um, so <laughs> when I, part of what I had to do in that time window of working full time, having a small baby, I had my son, um, four months into starting the program mm. and, um, <laughs> working full time, going full-time. to school full time and having a baby, I had to figure out what all of those efficiencies in where, where the opportunity for those in my life were. And everything um, was remote. Is that right? Were you yeah, working remote? You were pursuing the MBA remotely? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that a huge part of that was just like the timing and the state of the world at the time. Um, and you had and so had was, some, some experience working remote, which I think is another piece of, of really important had, credibility to that. Yeah, I had five years of full time remote experience. So working remote was the norm at that point. And I didn't have any new small children at home. We had my son December 2020, and he started daycare by February 2021. So um, we were really lucky here uh, that daycares were open um, from that window, you know, then soon after vaccines started coming around, I was there when the civic center did the drive through, like when it opened, got the shot, like, you know, we were very enthusiastic about those sorts of, um, reopening opportunities. But one of the things that was a result of that time period was that everything was remote. And so I wasn't losing time to commutes. Um, It was, we were also lucky that my husband was in a particularly flexible time in his career um, that I miss those days. (laughs) Uh, And so um, all these things happened at the same time. And it was actually in business school that I started having this inkling that there was a specific opportunity around supply chain, specifically this problem called three-way match. So if you think about like a, a shoe manufacturer, they cut purchase orders to their suppliers, they receive shoes in their warehouse, and then they have to pay the invoice to their supplier, right? Um, This problem, three-way match, is about reconciling the purchase order, the receipt, and the invoice, making sure that what you ordered is what you get, is what you pay for. So I'm in business school, I get this um, reading assignment that's like an HBR article on how Blockchain is the only solution to the three-way match problem. And I'm a bit of a like anti-blockchain e person. Blockchain's just a distributed database. I consider myself a database person. So um, I was like, no, this is a solution in search of a problem. I'm going to build a prototype using the database tools that we have. Um, and I did. And I was like, see, you don't need blockchain. You can solve this with a regular database. Like, yeah. this is silly. Um, and so started spending more time with it, did what all good found or founders or people who are considering opportunities do, which is that I went through every person in my network who could have an intelligent conversation on this topic. Like 
have you seen it? What have you seen? How does this problem solve itself? Like, you know, the whole nine yards. And um, then I finished grad school in May 2022, um, pregnant with my second kid at this point, and decided, like, cool, I suddenly have more free time. Um, I had my son, I, I'm thinking about it, still working full time. I uh, had my son in September was planning on um, taking some time off, just, you know, maternity leave and stuff, and said, cool, I'm going to use my maternity leave to make this, to to figure out if there's something here. Yeah. And so I did exactly that. I left Amplify, started working on Turbine full-time in September 2022. Um, and then we ended up raising a pre-seed round in December 2022, um, launched the product in spring 2023, and now we're working to drive business impact for folks in uh, across multiple verticals. And it's great. And, you know, I started obsessed with this three way match problem. What we found is like that's a piece of the puzzle. That's not that's not the whole puzzle. We actually help brands understand their supply chain costs and what that translates to in landed costs for their units. Um, we help them understand their profitability on a per order level. So lots of things that we help companies do. And like three-way match was my hook for spending more time. But the problem in the product has evolved as we've gotten feedback over time from customers, from users, from mentors. Um, and yeah, it's been a, a really interesting journey. But basically, I had to wait for things to free up in order to take the plunge. and. Now here we are. Yeah, what a what an interesting uh, timing of everything. You know, it's just like um, that that MBA kind of like wrapping up. You know, the um, going on maternity leave. You know, uh, providing the opportunity for you to spend a little time on this project. This your uh, your other baby, right? your, yeah. your 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 business baby, and and uh, obviously your your baby baby. But um, what a what a neat um, uh, timing for all that to kind of come together. And you know you you know again like doing my research on you 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 you're ranking <laughs> you're ranking uh, quite high uh, from an SEO perspective on operational workflows data um, you know three way match you know these things that you seem to be very passionate about. And again, I think, but not losing sight of these other experiences through your journey about adding value, right? Like how can I find this thing here to, you know, ensure that you're not spending X here or like, the, where can I find the value for you and your business? These are all the things that kind of come back to the root cause of what you're, what you're doing and why you're doing it. So I think that's all yeah. really you, neat. You know, one thing that comes up, um, Kind of pretty often. I'll, I'll actually share a uh, anonymous but specific example is that um, we were meeting with this Atlanta based brand, um, incredible team, wonderful product. And they came to us with like a very specific problem around forecasting. They they didn't have all the other problems that we help with that or those things were fine for now. They'll have them as they grow and that's fine. But today they're just focused on this very specific forecasting problem. And I said like, let's just schedule an hour long working session and I'll help you with your forecast and we can do this together and work through it and you'll come out of it with a better forecast. And I don't have anything to sell you because I'm not here to just take money for you for the sake of growing our revenue number. Like I, you're not going to use our solution. I don't want your money. Right. And right. And so I think so much of my job at this stage um, especially on those early conversations that we have with brands is like, do you have a problem that I can help you solve? And then is turbine actually going to make a difference to your brand? Because if the answer is no, then I want to help you, but like, I'm not going to sell you turbine if we can't actually drive impact yeah. for you. Yeah. I love that perspective. And I, you know, I think it's just a, a really top, class kind of like approach to sales like you know mm -hmm. I, I there's nothing worse than the the salesperson that's just really trying to you know sell you something you that you, you don't desperation. need desperation mm -hmm. yeah you can smell it right and so like you know i i i have a similar approach in terms of sales where it's look i don't even want to sell you something right now i just want to like 
see where I can see what your pain point is to see if I can, where, where we can add value. And then there's something beyond, you know, where I can add value now that we can have that conversation at a later time, but I don't want to, I'm not going to just spoon feed you like, Hey, this is what we do. So this is what you're going to need, you know? So yeah. I think that's a, uh, a really um, intentional and thoughtful approach to it. So just a couple of quick hits on turbine then, um, you know, what, um, you, your remote company, but you know, where, where are you headquartered? Um, what kind of headcount are you at right now? Yeah. So all remote company, the team is myself and three software engineers full time. Uh, we have a team member in San Antonio, a team member in Charlotte, North Carolina, and a team member in Nairobi, Kenya. Mm. Uh, oh. I'm lucky enough to have former colleagues who from Netlify who joined me to do this turbine thing, which is great. That's great. Um, and I'm based in Columbus, Georgia. Two or three days a week, I work out of the startup Columbus office. So if anyone's passing through, let me know. I'm happy to take people out <laughs> to coffee. Cool. Nice, nice shout out Columbus, Georgia. Um, and then you did mention, uh, you know, one of your investors and we were actually introduced through, uh, revolutions Revolution. rise of the rest. Yeah. Yes. So are they also a part of the uh, investment team? Yes. Um, James at revolutions rise of the rest, um, is my, or James is my investor over there and they're great. And I'm so grateful to have them as a sounding board, as a connector. Um, and I love their place-based mandate. Like as someone here in, uh, in Columbus, I think there's so much opportunity and so many great things going on here and really excited um, to have them on my team. Yeah, I love their, I love their strategy that you know, innovation can happen outside of just the coast, the coastal uh, yes. states, uh, coastal cities there. So um, uh, that's great. And then um, I, I would just kind of ask, you know, in terms of your all's anticipated growth, you know, what are some things that you know, I guess you're really looking forward to or excited about Turbine heading into to 2024? Yeah, you know, Turbine, um, by nature of how we solve problems for our customers is a very wide product. We do a lot of things. And the scale that I like to use when I talk about it is like there's minimum product, there's a workable product, and then there's a lovable product. And um, we've spent time bringing like our order to cash reconciliation and our procurement process into lovable stages. But um, some things are still minimum and I look forward to like our revenue recognition functionality, I would absolutely consider minimum. And so really thinking about how we can level that up and make that an even better experience for our existing users and our yet to come users. That's something I'm really looking forward to in the new year. Cool. Yeah, we're excited to track it. And um, obviously, love uh, loved hearing your story. Um, I've got a lot more questions, but I'm trying to keep this within a within a re reasonable time frame. And I do want to uh, jump into our, our final segment here as well, which is the five second scramble. And uh, this is just kind of like a, you know, rapid fire Q&A. Um, try, to, try to keep the answers within five seconds. If not, you know, we'll, we won't air horn you out yeah. or anything like that. A uh, little mix of some business, a little, little mix of some, some fun personal stuff. And uh, you ready to, to jump into it? Let's do it. Okay, cool. Um, so this might be, take you back to some of your VC pitches, uh, explain turbine to me as if I were a five-year-old. In five seconds. Wow. That is like the <laughs> hardest question you could ever come up with. <laughs> okay. We'll give you time. Uh, turbine is an operating platform for your brand's multi-channel workflows. And now I just have all these questions in my head around if a five-year-old could ever understand what multi-channel is. What does multi-channel mean? <laughs> you know what? Kids these days, when they hold phones up to their ears, they don't do this. And for the, for the audio portion of this, they don't like put their pinky and thumbs out. They put their hands flat and they hold it to their ear. Uh, <laughs> And I think about that a lot because kids have a totally under different understanding of technology than we do. Yeah. I mean, you know, Bluey can explain it to them, I'm sure. I, you know what? I'm looking forward to the day where Bluey makes an episode about Turbine. <laughs> Bluey just pitch it, pit, doing VC pitches. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. What is the, your favorite part about your culture at Turbine? 
we have three values, uh, ROI, results, ownership, iteration. And I think uh, the thing that I'm most proud of is how everyone works through that. Everyone shows ownership in their work. Everyone knows that we're iterating on delivering value. And the end result is that everyone produces results. Um, really cool. high performance team. It gives ROI a whole nother meaning for me oh, as an entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> um, what type of technologist would you say thrives at Turbine? Someone who's not afraid of rolling their sleeves up and doing the work. You know, sometimes what we're doing is solving a weird edge case for a customer with a cool technology problem. Sometimes what we're doing is going through a bad CSV download and finding all the rogue quotes in the middle of text. Uh, and so every day can be different, but it's got to be someone who cares more about the business impact than the technology. Cool. Um, as a, an entrepreneur, um, a mother, spouse, you know, in, in your free time, what do you do to kind of relax or unwind? Uh, I love weightlifting. Um, so if I had to put it into three, one, I love Olympic weightlifting. It brings me so much joy. I'm lucky enough to have the space in my time to, to do it to, um, I really enjoy reading, currently reading um, Greg Bluestein's book on the recent Georgia elections called Flipped, and it's so much fun. Cool. And reading is like watching a movie in your head. Um, and then three is just really hanging out with my family, and they bring me so much joy, and I'm so grateful to have them. Awesome. Not in they... that order. <laughs> yeah, we, we can edit that to be the family first. <laughs> Uh, what is a, a charity or corporate philanthropy that is near and dear to you? So uh, St. Wahlberg Monastery in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, I went to a high school that's since closed called Benedictine Academy. It was the sister school to St. Benedict's Prep, a well-known all-boys school in Newark, New Jersey. And I went to BA on a full scholarship which is incredible because I could not have gone to BA um, if it wasn't for that. My family was not in a position where we could afford private school. Um, and so St. Walburg Monastery, I often think about how that scholarship changed the whole trajectory of my life. Awesome. Good shout out. Can you briefly describe your morning routine to me? <laughs> briefly. Uh, <laughs> wake up when my kids are howling. Uh, <laughs> If, if I get to wake up before them, enjoy my two cups of coffee, maybe read a couple of pages until they wake up. And then I do the morning shift solo in my household. So I get my kids ready, uh, load them, uh, feed them breakfast, load them into the car, get them to daycare, come home uh, and work. Or if it's a gym day, um, I might go right to the gym after daycare. Every day is different because mm -hmm. toddlers are in charge. Yeah, well said. If you could live abroad for one season out of the year, where would you live and what season? Is pasta season in Italy an appropriate answer? Yeah, that it's like one. rainy season or pasta season. I think yeah. it's pasta season. Pasta season. So pasta season in Italy, that, that needs to be on a brochure somewhere. <laughs> um, what is the worst fashion trend that you've ever followed? bootleg jeans and it's back now and that makes it that much worse <laughs> that's what fashion trends do though they don't know. they go out of style and they come back in style <sighs> kids these days <laughs> what's something that you love to do but you're really bad at a lot a lot <laughs> um needlepoint so I make one ornament per year for my family. It's like our my Christmas thing is I create one needlepoint ornament. And I am mediocre to poor at it, but I <laughs> make one ornament a year and that's all that matters. I can't wait for this Etsy sh shop to open up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, they take so long. <laughs> There's a reason I only make one a year. <laughs> the supply chain on the back orders would be horrendous. <laughs> um, what was your dream job as a kid? Aside from a barista at Dunkin' Donuts? Uh, President of the United States. Cool. That's the first time I've ever heard that answer. That's, that's, that's great. And in closing, favorite Disney character? Ah. 
I don't know, probably the whole Inside Out crew. They're pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. That's the first time we've heard that as well. So that's, that's a good answer as well. That is a wrap. So I just wanted to thank you for spending time with us. Um, excited for the future of, of what you all are building at Turbine. You are an awesome entrepreneur. Um, you're a good human. I'm, I'm confident you're going to continue to have success. So I'll be rooting you all on from the sidelines. And I want to thank you for hanging out with us on, on the pod. Yeah, thanks for having me and uh, look forward to uh, sharing what I know. So much appreciated. Cool.